Okay, welcome everyone to our weekly Firefly community call. Uh, today, we are gonna be hearing from Peter Broadhurst about uh, message sequencing in Firefly and kind of how the internals of the system work. Uh, it's kind of a, an important part of how the system works. And uh, we'll have some open discussion after that. Uh, as a reminder, this is a public meeting. It is being recorded and the recording will be public as well. So just uh, wanted to throw that out there. Uh, again, welcome and thank you for coming and I'll turn it over to Peter. Thanks, Nico. So um, we're, we're, we're going to go. That was my fault, sorry. <laughs> we're going to we're going to do, I guess, probably part one of message sequencing. Um, the, the slides here are going to go down into the weeds. I'm probably going to not go all the way down today because there's just a lot of information. Um, and um, I really want to make sure that we've talked about why Firefly is trying to solve the problems that Firefly is trying to solve um, and try and make, make it clear the value um, that um, message sequencing is one very important thing where there's actually heavy lifting code inside of Firefly. It's probably the most complicated piece of actual code in Firefly um, because it's almost by definition something that none of the individual components that are underneath Firefly can do for themselves. So what I, I want to really address head on sort of why is there all this sophistication about ordering? Is, is Kaleido just about ordering things? Sorry, it's Firefly just about ordering things or is Firefly, um, you know, is it treating the things underneath it as just dumb things that need to be ordered? No. Um, however, Ordering is something that always ends up getting built on top of these underlying technologies. And Firefly is there to stop you needing to build things like Firefly on top of the underlying technologies. So um, the, the, the picture here, I think, I think um, in America it's Funball, is it? Is that the... I have no idea actually what that thing's called. I've, I've seen these things in, um, yeah. in, 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 in playgrounds around, around, around these, these next to the woods. And they are a absolutely fantastic analogy for how um, how business networks need to deal with things in order um, uh, and we'll see we'll see we'll come back to that and it'll be a little bit clearer in a minute and I'm not just inferring that all business networks are like a bunch of bunch of kids playing in a playing in a yard um, uh, although I'm sure we can all recognize a few similarities at times so so the sequencing is one of the most important constructs that enable multi-party business processes to function. Um, this is not new to blockchain in any way, shape or form, but, um, uh, and, and definitely not, not new to multi-party systems. Um, the, the whole suite of technology that used to be called, or uh, well, still is called, business process management technology, but used to solve um, business processes inside of an organization and is incredibly valuable inside of a multi party system inside of each of the organizations themselves has considered this one of the top problems um, for, for the whole of whole of my, my career. Um, and it, if you've got a business process um, inside of just one organization, how does it work? Well, you create an instance of it, a, a long running process instance. Um, you give it an ID, and then you create a flowchart, and the flowchart might be expressed in BPMM or some sophisticated um, technology like that. You create a flowchart that says this happens, then this happens, then a decision happens, and it branches left or right, and then this happens. If at any given point in time, it's like quantum computing, it might have gone this way, or it might have gone this way, or it might have gone both ways at the same time. You can't build a business process, it's impossible. What you end up building is that every single step, um, you have to build compensation logic that says, well, we'll assume we're going in both directions. And then when we realize that we've actually gone in one direction and not the other, we'll go back and we'll sort of compensate for the one that we did speculatively that we didn't mean to do. And it's a horrible nightmare and a mess. So the way a sensible business process works is just straight through process from beginning 
to act. Now, if you've got one central system inside of one organization, that's not easy to achieve. Business process management software in itself is super complicated, but it's a process that's solved by creating a highly available central system with a database inside of it, inside of one organization. And there'll be a database and there'll be messaging systems to coordinate the, the, the actions. Like that's what people have been doing for business process management. Um, you know, a decade and a half now, people have been thinking about this problem and doing it inside of the business. When you do the multi-party version of that, things become interesting because you've got multiple people with their own autonomous, independent systems, their own sources of truth. And this is where blockchain is magic, genuinely magic for these multi-party systems. Because multi-party systems, people have been building them for many, many years. Um, but blockchain-based ones have a, a, a construct that no one's had before, which is we can have an agreed sequence of events. Um, and it does mean just a little bit of extra complexity for the poor developer of the business process, regardless of what tool you're using. And Firefly cares deeply about just developers building code. So we think about it as REST APIs um, fundamentally. And it's just the same business process that would be created for one organization. You have to model it such that each step could be performed by a different organization. And when a, um, an organization decides to move to the next step, they can look at all of the previous history. So if I'm, if I'm this step here at party three, I can look back and I can see the sequence of events that happened in an agreed order. And we'll talk about how that's possible. I can look back and I can decide to take the next step. But the one tweak, the one little bit of programming awkwardness that we can't get away from is that I have to wait until everybody's agreed that I've stated what the next step is in the sequence before I can trust that it's true. I can't just say, I decide that this is the next step and go. I need to say, I initiate what I believe the next step is, and then I wait until it's been confirmed on the blockchain that my record, you know, signed proof from me that I want to initiate the next step in the process has been confirmed. Then it's confirmed for everybody, and no one can now insert a step before that. But if we just try to do it at the same time, then um, or I assume that because I said it, um, and at the point that I said it, nobody else had said anything else, um, I assume that it's the next step, we'll get into trouble. So I'm going to just go back to the analogy that we talked about at the beginning of that, that fun ball um, uh, game, where you've got all of those people throwing balls into a, um, into a, a funnel, um, basically. Fun has got multiple exits on the funnel, which makes it more complicated. But we're going to talk about a funnel that's only got one hole at the bottom. Um, and um, the, the, you can, as one of the parties in the network, and this scales to as many parties as you like, so just simplest to explain it to. Um, you, you've got Bob on the left or Sally on the right here. Each of them, they know the steps they are performing and they know the order in which they perform them or they want to perform them. Um, if what they're doing is just saying, I'm going to do the next one, I'm going to do the next one and do the next one, and they're not waiting for them to be confirmed, think of it like throwing those balls up into the, up into the, um, the, the fumble um, funnel, right? You're, you know the order in which you sent them. Like if, if Bob's got blue balls and Sally's got orange balls here, um, Bob knows he said he threw ball one, then he threw ball two, then he threw ball three. But he's no idea whether his ball one is going to come out the bottom of the funnel before or after Sally's ball one, if they go in the air at the same time, or if they land in the funnel and they're rattling around the funnel at the same time. There's no way for either of them to know at the point they throw them which one's going to come out of the bubble of the funnel first. But it's not hard. You just need to look at the bottom of the funnel rather than the top. 
you, you've got to you've got to throw the ball and then you've got to wait and you've got to see the order that it comes out and and that's um uh, it, it's not a hard concept and it seems pretty trivial it it's the thing that has been impossible in these multi-party networks before if you just have rest apis to each other you know you didn't have a blockchain in the middle you didn't have a multi-party system with you know the current generation of, of, of technology suite you were just using rest apis and messaging you could absolutely have an agreement over um over you know i i, I talk to you and i say something but if you've got five people in the system you can't without a lot of sophistication basically building something like a blockchain you can't agree a single order between everybody you need a consensus algorithm, something which is going to make it final what order the events occur in. So that, that, that's, that it, it, it's, it, it's maybe um, sometimes an under, you know, in the world of tokens and, and the like, it, it, it's, it's um, an underrepresented value on its own, in its own right. Um, the fact that blockchains at their core are a sequence of events um, and it it's worth just mentioning it's also the thing that makes tokens possible this same construct is what allows tokens to be built on top so just like you can build a very well proven business process like total conservation of value of a of a fungible token or uniqueness of an ID for a um, uh, and, and propagation of ownership of um, of a unique uh, a unique ID in the case of non fungible tokens, you can build that on ordering concept constructs. And Andrew last week was talking about how Firefly thinks it's worth actually bringing those in as core constructs, tokens and the like, into um, into Firefly's API. You can also build arbitrary business processes on this fundamental like air and water of of the blockchain ecosystem piece of piece of tech now there's a but coming um which is wouldn't it be great if all of the information that we wanted could just go on to this sequencing information like tokens work because all of the information that backs the things that co tokens provide you ownership information uniqueness goes onto the blockchain enterprise business processes just can't work that way just almost universally the data itself can't go onto the sequencing tech and that's for two reasons um what one is the data just isn't the right regulatory shape right maybe it needs to be deleted at some point in the future Maybe it's too sensitive to be shared on the blockchain. Maybe it's just competitive information you're giving away by putting all that data on the blockchain. That's one, one problem. The other is it's really expensive to do this multi-party agreement on data. It's really expensive. These consensus algorithms are hard. So if you slam huge amounts of data, you say, look, here's my, here's my 100 megabyte PDF file, stick it into the ordering construct, like into the actual ordering construct itself, you jam up the pipes. Um, and because it's an ordering construct, it has to be sequenced one after the other. You've only got one, one pipe here. So it's um, not appropriate to try and push all of your data for those two reasons through the pipe itself. So that's why um, Firefly um, has all of this sophistication built into it for coordination. Um, I was using the... In the technology, in most of the, the, um, the architecture, you'll see this, this term aggregation being used. Um, and I was talking that over with, with Nico here a little bit this morning, and um, I don't know if the term's right or wrong, but I wanted just to explain what we mean. Like, there's multiple things happening, but there's only one source of truth of the order. There's, there's a truth of, source of truth, which is the blockchain for the order in which things happen. But the blockchain does not contain the actual business data. And maybe there's not just one piece of business data. Maybe the thing that I'm trying to order is a step in the business process, which has a little bit of JSON metadata 
but with some signatures inside of it that say, look, I attest that this is the stage of the business process. Maybe there's 10 attachments that are each a megabyte in size. And all, and, and then there's the core blockchain thing. And like all those five or 10, whatever it is, like bits of data need to be distributed to everybody. Um, but they can only be processed by everybody in the order that things happened on the blockchain. So you need to sort of treat the blockchain as a source of truth and then wait for the other things to arrive before you can act on it. Um, and, and that's really um, where that heavy lifting is inside of the um, inside of a firefly. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to talk through this one in some more detail. We're going to flip. We're going to sort of go on the high level of some of the more advanced constructs that build on top of this. Like how do you mask, do advanced privacy on top of some of this stuff? But I'm just going to talk through this diagram end to end, and we're going to talk about how Firefly is built and how as a developer against it, you need to understand this piece. It's built to um, give a global order, a global order uh, sequence of events to real private and shared business data of any size and shape in the business network. And um, it comes with a built-in contract that allows you to do that where the only thing that goes on the blockchain is just, just the sequence of events um, and it is compatible the architecture with a next step that we expect to be taking in the coming months to allow that blockchain transaction to be as sophisticated as you like and still to be coordinated with blockchain data and it starts with transaction submission so just like on the previous chart now we've got to, we've got you know we've got bob and bob and sally here and, and bob's in member one and and um and, and sally's over here in, in member member two and they've got an application. Okay, their application is connected to a Firefly core, which is the API server of Firefly. And they're connected to it using REST APIs and, and WebSockets. Could be webhooks as well, but just taking the example of it's a REST API and a WebSocket. So you've just got, you've got a REST API connection from this app to this core. Now, a really important point is that this app in a real world production scenario, might be being scaled up, being scaled down. It's probably would probably be the back end of a web app. So you're probably running five instances of it. Um, Firefly's designed to still be able to provide these assurances that we're talking about here, even if you've got a horizontally scaled application. And the architecture, and there are some points of detail here that aren't fully fleshed out, is also su supported where Firefly be horizontally scaled so that my Firefly can have a few instances and your Firefly can have a few instances. Um, and they're still, you know, this is still just my one Firefly. And that's possible because underneath it, we use a database and we make a lot of use of the database in Firefly um, in order to be able to provide a very simple contract between Firefly and the application to be able to take away genuinely many thousands of lines of code that might be needed to be in the application can be pushed down to Firefly and the app just doesn't have to worry about it because Firefly relies on a point of consistency that's a highly available database. So we rely a lot on that. So as an app, you just say to the, your, your, your Firefly, you just say, add a message, right? Send the red message, send the green message. And Firefly will do all of the batching um, and other, other, other things that are necessary to efficiently use the, the, the technologies, to efficiently use a messaging technology, to efficiently use a public storage technology like IPFS, which is very inefficient to take like a kilobyte of data. And every time you have a kilobyte of data, create a new shared file on IPFS, hugely inefficient. So Firefly does all the batching to say, I'm going to put hundreds of these inside of one, one file that gets stored in, in IPFS, one message that gets transferred across. Um, there's all of that batching. And each Firefly um, node is responsible to making sure that the order of your events is preserved. So if you send a green message before a red message, the green message is going to come out the other side for everybody in the network before the red message. But there's no assurance at the point that you send that REST API and you say acknowledged 
Right? This, this, um, this message has is being sent. There's no assurance at that point that it's the next message in the actual sequence. Because Sally over here in her organization, her app is sent, is, is sent a blue message at the same time that we were sending the red and the green messages. So there's this arbitrator, the blockchain in the middle, and the blockchain locks in the order. Um, so the Firefly cores both send a request through the blockchain interface, which is pluggable. Um, so we talked about the maturity of the, um, the Ethereum, the, the standard development on the fabric, which is probably going to be a topic for another one of these coming up soon. Um, and then what we've done in the past to prove this out on Corda, um, that you have a, an interface to the blockchain, which is, um, is about reliably getting it onto the blockchain and then detecting an event when it's made it on the blockchain. So these, on this side, the green message goes on first, then the red message. On this side, the blue message goes in and the blockchain orders it green, blue, red. And those events come out to the both sides, to both sides. And the events go back to the applications. Now, this is the really important piece in your application, if you want to be a business process that's genuinely multi-party safe, you can't treat your step as processed. You can't act on it. You can't update your core systems of record inside of your organization. You can't treat it as confirmed until you process it in the order that it comes out of the blockchain, not the order it goes in. So this application sent red, then green, okay? If it didn't wait for red to be confirmed as the next thing before it sent green, that's fine. But all it's doing is it's, put, it's queuing things up for processing. It needs to process, sorry, sent green, then red, apologies. Um, it needs to process not green, then red, it needs to process green, then blue, then red. And if it does that, then it's assured to have performed its processing in the same order as Sally has. So Bob and Sally have both processed red, sorry, green, blue, red, green, blue, red on both sides. Now that is, like I'm laboring the point because it is a change in the way that you program. You, you have to say to, um, on your user experience, for example, you can still have beautiful user experiences, but the user experience will immediately say, thank you, pending. And then we'll update a few seconds later to say confirmed, or it might say rejected. Think about an example um, like spending. Um, I have a business process where um, somebody in the business network says, I've got a credit for dumps. And the other net members of the network say, I'd like to bid on that, that credit for bananas. And everyone's waiting to do it. So this might be happening in a very short period of time. That credit bananas can only be given to one of those parties. So, um, so all of those parties that are saying, um, I want to purchase this credit bananas because right now at the point in my application that I look at the state, this credit bananas is eligible to be, to be sold. I'd like to buy it. That's great. You've said I'd like to buy it. The outcome, once it's ordered with everybody else who says they'd like to buy it, might be, well done, you've bought it. Or it might be, I'm sorry, someone else got there first. And that's a really simple example where you can see the, 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 the real world implications of if you just assume 
that because you lured your local database and your local database said that bananas were available, I'm going to buy them. Thank you very much. And you didn't wait for it to be confirmed, then you you could end up uh, assuming that you've got something that you haven't, um, and with an inconsistent state between you and the other members of the of the, of the business network. The way this has always worked in the past before blockchain was well, that was all great. Everybody did it, and then reconciled. But afterwards, you had all kinds of compensation logic, you had legal um, disputes that could take weeks or months, or you just waited for like confirmation to happen on, on the phone and with humans or with UPS stuff flying around the world, um, you know, sending paperwork um, that's been signed and you need copies of paperwork. This construct means that you can do this digitally and it's, and it's really powerful. Peter, do you want to question you want to take it now yeah let's, okay. let's take a question great right. uh, what if the contract in bc layer reject a transaction question is because it will help to understand if we need to model our logic to adopt to the behavior of firefly um so if a um if the on-chain um transaction um and we're talking about a mode that you can't do immediately today at the moment which is custom on-chain logic um, if you have on-chain logic that is making decisions based on what's on-chain as the source of truth, then it's important that you omit events from the blockchain that describe the different outcomes. So you should write your blockchain logic to omit a yes or a no. And that means that that what goes in is a red request what comes out is a red yes or a red no depending on what the blockchain data said so and this is about the aggregation that we're not going to go through in detail um, there's charts like this that talk about how it works that we're going to go through once we've had enough of these that everyone feels like we want to be talking in this sort of level of detail of how it works in its core but fundamentally the application, like the, the point it receives the red, it's got the on-chain information of the result of the transaction, pass, fail, in between, some data generated from the blockchain. It's got that conclusively, for sure, from the blockchain. It's also got the off-chain data that went with it that it can correlate it with. So you get the value of the event sequencing because you're not just rejecting it from the blockchain, just to be really clear, you're emitting a rejection event from the blockchain, which the application can process off-chain. So the core system said, I'd like to buy the credit bananas. The core, and, and, and locally, that, that, that's a, a request sent to, to purchase the credit bananas. What comes back out is on-chain, there was a bit of information that said no, and off-chain is, it's this crate of bananas with this particular OFID tag in the box, right? That data might've been off-chain and the yes or no might've been on-chain. When the application gets it, Firefly is gonna make sure all of that's been aggregated back together again. So you get an event that comes with all of that data, as well as that, that very, usually very small piece of information that's on the blockchain itself. Does that help? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's also uh, worth repeating, I, I guess, the, the assumption here, which is the default uh, smart contract that uh, gives you the ordering uh, doesn't really have any logic in it. If, when, you look at, when, when you look at in the uh, source code, it has no logic. So uh, you always get the sequence emitted, and there is no, there's, there's almost zero chance for that to be failing. Um, it's more likely that it's going to be fading because there's networking issues, there's there's other things, and Firefly is built around those to make sure that doesn't uh, get populated into the application layer. So using Firefly with the with the basic functionalities, uh, you don't have to be overly concerned with the fading uh, on, on with the on-chain logic. I'm going to just tee up because we're, we're 33 minutes past. So I know we started a few minutes late, but we've, we've always said that these 
these sessions. We don't want it to be dominated by just having to listen to, to one person talk through a bunch of slides. So we're going to we're going to try and cut in a couple of minutes and just get to open questions, which can be on this or they can be on anything else. So I just want to tee up the bits that we're not going through today. The first is how on earth is it possible to do all of the things that we just talked about on the on the last chart? This is like an example of what, how, if you chose not to use Firefly and you really wanted to solve this problem correctly, the level of sophistication you would have to build into your application layer to not have to build it yourself. So, so um, to, 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 you know, to not use Firefly. So, so this will go through at a point that, we're, that it makes sense to sort of go a level below the previous diagram. Now, the, the next one, I think, is something that probably a bunch of people on the call are excited about if you're in blockchain, which is how the heck do you, can you do that without leaking information on the blockchain? In the case that this is a private sequence of events, and in the case, and this is true almost universally, including when you're using channels, including when you're using channels, some of the data needs to be hidden from the parties maintaining the channel. So maybe I've got five parties on a, on a fabric channel because I've got the supplier and I've got the auditor and I've got the purchaser um, and, and I've got the shipping company all on the same channel because they need to see the sequence of events. That doesn't mean that all of the data fields and all of the, all of the, um, the pieces of the transaction need to be seen by everybody. If, you're, if the blockchain is an open one, it's not like a fabric channel, it's, it's like the everybody channel that you've set up on your fabric environment, or it's an Ethereum chain, so everybody's in, involved in it, it's your enterprise Ethereum chain like Corum um, or Hyperledger Besu, then um, it's going to be maintained by lots of people. They, they need to not be able to see what's going on. And you need to be able to hide who's performing the transaction, you need to be able to hide the data that's part of the transaction. And then here's the hard bit, and here's what we'll go through in some number of weeks time when we're ready for it. You want to hide the fact that this sequence of events are a sequence of events, because that's metadata leakage. The fact that five events happened and there's five events that happened together, you can, from that, you can deduce it's probably one of these transactions that was happening. So it is considered leakage to have the same identifier on chain in all of your transactions if you're trying to keep things really, really, really um, uh, uh, obscured from people. And that's a hard problem to solve, but it is something that's solved um, in, in, in Firefly, we believe. So we look forward to a conversation in, in a little while where we talk about exactly how Firefly does that um, that masking um, in, in truly private transactions uh, while still being able to preserve order and uh, avoiding the big problem in ordering is actually not how do you order, it's how what do you stop if something goes wrong? How much of the world stops because you don't receive something? And how do you deal with that situation? That's actually the hard thing in, it's always been the hard thing in message mesh sequencing way, way, way before, before blockchain. So that's enough of me waffling, waffling on. Um, uh, so we wanted to sort of go to the open discussion section.